made me whole. I didn't know what to expect the night that I knelt in that altar of prayer. I tell you, I got more, more than I could have ever hoped for. All I really wanted was to be forgiven for the mess that I had made out of my life. But I got so much more than that, Brother Rose. Yes, he forgave me, he pardoned me. I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I was wondering, Brother Houston, sitting there on the front bench, what it's like gonna, gonna be like to get in on a service when we don't have to deal with being tired anymore or don't have to deal with any pain in these bodies, don't have to deal with a, any distractions in our mind that might take our mind and our heart off of him. I'll tell you, it's gonna be a glad day. I hope you'll be there for that day, amen when our Lord comes and takes us home. If you have your Bibles this morning, please turn to the book of Revelation, chapter number two. Revelation, chapter number two, for the reading of the word of God. I brought several messages, I, I guess, back in May, uh, thinking along the lines of John Saul, some things that John saw in the book of Revelation. And then... Uh, it was brought to my heart and my attention as I was uh, looking at the, the word of God, the Bible, that not only did John see, but he was instructed to write. In chapter one, verse 19, he said, write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. John wrote to us about Christ and then John wrote to us about the church and that's where we're studying now. But then John writes later about the tribulation hour. He writes about the marriage of the lamb. He writes about the coming of the savior, amen, the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, I'd like to key in if I could for a little while. I kind of doubtful that I'll get finished with this message this morning, but um, I used to remember I remember when I was I used to be preaching in prison, it seemed like the the pressure, the time pressure uh, many times would get to you. You only had a certain block of time and uh, the, the officers were coming for the men whether you were finished or not. And uh, it's a joy to be in a situation like I am here where we can just kind of relax and know that people aren't looking at their watches. Help us, Jesus, amen. I've apologized several times since I've been pastor for the time thinking that I went way too long. Folks say, what are you talking about? It didn't bother us a bit, amen, and that's a blessing. That's a blessing. But anyway, we'll probably come back tonight and uh, pick up the, the message and conclude tonight, God willing. I just don't see getting through all of it, but you never know. Now, we're gonna look here. We looked at Pergamos the last time we looked in chapter number two. Let's move down to verse number 18. And uh, the Lord is writing through the apostle John to the church at Thyatira. He said unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, these things saith the Son of God, who hath eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Until I studied this time, I think I've mentioned this, but it seems like in John's description of the glorified Christ, he mentions a part of that description to each one of these churches when he writes. He said, I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works. He repeated that. And the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, here comes this statement again, I have a few things against thee. 
I'd like to reiterate that in that early church at Ephesus, he said, I have somewhat against thee. And then when he writes to the church at Pergamos, he said, I have a few things against thee. And at Thyatira, again, he says, I have a few things against thee. Kind of looks to me like if a church loses her first love, that that somewhat is likely to turn into a few things. And I believe we're living in a generation where it's turned into a lot of things. Are you listening to me? There are a lot of people meeting this morning in the name of the Lord and they call it a church. But our Lord doesn't even recognize some of the things that's going on in his name in these days. The Bible said here, notwithstanding I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel which calleth herself a prophetess. Who in this world would name a daughter Jezebel after studying about Ahab and Jezebel, I wouldn't name a female dog of mine Jezebel, amen? And I wonder how in this uh, early church age that there could be a woman called Jezebel. Boy, I tell you, that'd be something to be proud of, wouldn't it, amen? I don't understand that. Which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now look, notice this. You say, preacher, how does God feel about this woman? I want you to see something. And I gave her space to repent. Boy, if you don't get anything out of this message, but this right here, I want you to know that God give this wicked woman in the church at Thyatira space to repent. And you're looking at a man that believe God gives every individual space to repent. And yet we've got Baptists that are arguing whether it's even necessary or not to repent. Well, I'm not gonna argue with Jesus. He said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. I can understand that. I'm just a country boy. Paul said, repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible said here, I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not. You know what? The whole world is in two classes. Repented and repented not. Saved and lost. Repented and repented not. A lot of people say, well, repentance is a work. It is, it's a work of God, just like faith is. Say amen right there. I'm gonna tell you something, right? God gives us the ability, amen? We couldn't do that on our own. He grants us repentance. The Bible said here, behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation except they repent of their deeds. You remember the scripture over there in the book of Hebrews where it said marriage is honorable in all and the bed is undefiled but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. You say that's strong language. No, I just quoted a verse of scripture. You won't get any stronger than the Bible when it comes to dealing with sin. The Bible said here, and I will kill her children. Boy, you say, preacher, that doesn't sound good. No, it sounds like judgment. A lot of people want to hear about God's goodness, God's grace, and God's love, and God's mercy, and I enjoy hearing about all that too. But if you preach the whole counsel of God, you must preach that there's another side of that holy God, another side of that righteous God that deals with, with sin, I'll kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say 
And here's a little hinge here. God's dealing with something in the middle, something that's going on in the church. But thank God there was still some faithful ones in the church. He said, unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which you have already, boy, I like this, hold fast till I come. I tell you, there's some things church want to hang on to till he comes, amen. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father, I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Let's pray together. Father, I sure do need your help as we approach, Lord, this portion of scripture this morning. God, I pray this morning that those that are under the sound of our voice that have repented, Lord, they would rejoice in that repentance, rejoice in that salvation, God, that you bought and paid for on Calvary. Lord, those that are under the sound of my voice that have not repented, I pray, God, they would consider, Lord, the error of their way. I pray they would consider the end of their way. And I pray, Lord, that they would turn to the Lord this day. Lord, we love you. Lord, we love your word. God, we love your people. God, we love the Holy Spirit, Lord, that ministers to us uh, I pray, oh God, that you'll have your way in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. John is writing to the church at Thyatira. I'm going to give you just a couple of things by way of introduction. The name Thyatira means sacrifice, unceasing sacrifice. And I, I want to say this, especially to our young people this morning. We sit in a church like this. God has blessed us tremendously. But I'm telling you that down through the years, there are people that have sacrificed. I thought about this week, and you might think I'm crazy, but I've heard stories, Brother Ralph, about Brother Rossi and others over there in that old building. They'd work all day and then come in and work of the evening to build a church for the glory of God. I'll get into some of that a little bit later on, but I just want to tell you this. Uh, beloved, things don't just happen. There has to be some sacrifice along the way. There has to be somebody that says, I love him more than I love me. I want to do something for him more than I want to do something for me. Amen. Uh, and here in the word of God, we see in Thyatira some of that going on. This uh, Thyatira was a city that was known for their wool industry, was known for the dye industry. Uh, they were, it was there, uh, especially purple, the purple dye that was used by royalty and used by people of wealth had its origin in the city of Thyatira. You remember in the Bible, a certain woman named Lydia over in Acts 6, 14, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us. Watch this now. Glory to God. This goes with what I said about repentance and faith. Whose heart the Lord opened, amen, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. So that's just a little bit about the history of this city. I want to give you, I think, four things in the message. I want to start with, uh, this is a word from Christ. And then we see, not only is it a word from Christ, we see it's a word of commendation. And then we see it is also a word of confrontation. And then the message will end with it's a word of consolation. I want to start this morning with it being a word from Christ. You say, preacher, what do you mean? The Bible said here in verse number 18, unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these things saith the Son of God. I believe we need to get back to what 
some of the old prophets used to say as they were writing under the inspiration of the Holy, uh, the Holy uh, God, the Holy Spirit, and wrote down the Holy Word of God so that you and I can have it. You say, get back to what, preacher? Here's what we need to get back to. Thus saith the Lord. I'm telling you, beloved, listen, you can argue with me, but you're wasting your time arguing with him, amen. I believe with all of my heart, what God wants the church at Thyre Tower to know is this. This is not John's word. This is my word. This is not John's message. It's my message. And it's a personal message to you, the church at Thyre Tower. Have you ever wondered as we go through these seven churches, what would the letter read like? to the church at Bible Way, to the church at Kingsport. You say, preacher, uh, why would you wonder something like that? Only God knows, amen, I'll tell you. But we ought to think along those ways, amen. Somebody said this and I thought it was good. What kind of church would my church be if every member was just like me? What kind of letter would he write to your house and my house and the house of God here at Bible Way. It's a word from Christ. Uh, Let me give you several things here about Christ. He's the one in the scripture. He's the son of God. Uh, You say, preacher, what do you mean? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. I believe, Brother Steve, I've been guilty as I sat there on the front bench of making a mistake. Uh, Through the years, I've told people that you can't even get out of Genesis chapter three without Christ being mentioned. When, when, when talking about enmity between thy seed and the woman's seed. But let me tell you something right now. You just get to the fourth word in the Bible. In the beginning, God. And right there, beloved, you have Christ. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Without him was not anything made that was made. My friend, in him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shined in darkness. I believe you have Christ in the fourth word of the Holy Bible, in the beginning, God. Amen. Beloved, a word from Christ. He's the one in the scripture. He's the one that was sent, the Son of God. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. Aren't you glad, thank God, that we had a Father that loved us enough to send his Son into this sin-benighted world to give his life for you and for me. It's a word from Christ. Listen, he's the one in the scripture. He's the one that was sent. He's the one that served The Bible said even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. The Bible said in Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. I say thank God, he's the one in the scripture. He's the one that was sent. He's the one that was served and he's the one that was sacrificed on an old rugged cross. He's the son of God. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And Bible said in Ephesians 5 and 2, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. The Bible said in Hebrews 7, 27, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sin and then for the people. For this he did once when he offered up himself. Thank God Jesus died once for all and it's sufficient to cover the sin of the whole world. He's the one that was sacrificed. You might say, Pastor, that reading a while ago, that got a little bit rough. I tell you, the Lord got rough on the church at Thyatira. Let me tell you something. It's his church. He bought it. He paid for it with his own precious blood. Let me tell you something else. You might not like what I'm about to say, but every once in a while, if you love your youngins, you'll have to get a little bit rough on them too. 
Say amen. You should have seen the look on Olivia's face yesterday when I told Olivia, Papa loves you. And because Papa loves you, Papa cannot give you everything you want. Now there is a tendency. Say amen. Spoil them. You'll always be the hero. But I'm gonna tell you something I believe is more important than spoiling them, and that's loving them. I'm gonna tell you something right now. God's not interested in spoiling the church. He's interested in loving the church. And he said, whom I love, I chasten. Amen. He rebukes and he chastens. He's the one that was sacrificed, the son of God on a hill called Calvary. He's the one that was seen, the son of God. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number four that he was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scripture. He was seen of Cephas, then of the 12. After that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain until the present but some are fallen asleep. Paul said after that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles and last of all Paul, Paul said, he was seen of me as one born out of due time. Thank God he wasn't just sacrificed, but he got up the third day and was seen among men as the glorious Savior of the world, the resurrected Christ. By the way, not only is he the one in the scripture, the one that was sent, the one that served, the one that was sacrificed, the one that was seen. You say, preacher, where'd you get all that? Well, right here, this one verse, these things saith the Son of God. I'm just trying to tell you who the Son of God is, amen. I'm just trying to tell you for just a moment, you say, preacher, that don't do nothing for me. Maybe you ought to get to know him and maybe it would, amen. To know that he was sent just for you. He was crucified just for you. He rose from the dead just for you. Hallelujah, it's personal. He's the one that saves, he's the son of God. For the son of man has came, come to seek and to save that which is lost. Jesus said in another scripture, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That's why he told the Pharisees, uh, he said, you say, you see, therefore you're still blind. Hallelujah. I tell you, when a man's gonna get to see is when he realizes he's blind. Amen. And when he says, hey, I need to see him that loved me and gave himself for me. He's the one that saves. He's the son of God. He's the one that secures. He's the son of God. Here's the reason a lot of people struggle with assurance. Listen to me carefully. And they say, well, he can do the saving, but he can't do the keeping. Oh, yes, he can. I tell you what, if he does the saving, he'll do the securing. You say, preacher, what do you mean? Listen to what the Bible said. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. He said, I know them. He said, they follow me. I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. If I did not have another verse in the Bible, I could take that verse right there, run with it to heaven, amen. Jesus said, listen, the gift of God is eternal life. I'm the one that gives eternal life. And when I give it to a man, when I give it to a woman, when I give it to a boy, when I give it to a girl, they shall never perish. I don't know about you. That don't make me wanna live like hell. That makes me want to serve the Lord. I've had people say, well, preach, if I believed that, I'd just do whatever I wanted to. No, if you believed that, you'd do what he wanted you to do. You'd love him, you'd serve him, amen. You'd submit to him, you'd sacrifice your life. It would be a sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. Oh, beloved friend, he's the one that secures. He said, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My father which gave them me is greater than all. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my father's hand. Somebody said this one time. We're in the hand of God. We're in the hand of Jesus. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit. Now just think about this for just a moment. If a devil could get through all that, and get to us. He'd be saved by the time he got to us and he wouldn't want us when he got there. Say amen right there. We're in his hand this morning, amen. 
That should make us want to live loose. That ought to make us want to live for the Lord. Have a testimony for God's sake. He's the one that secures. He's the one that secures. That's a word that means comfort. Wherefore, the Bible said in Hebrews 2, 17, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto us, his brethren, that he might be a merciful and a faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted. He's able to secure them that are tempted. You say, preacher, nobody knows what I'm going through. I want you to know this this morning. There there may not be a person on earth I'm talking about in the physical sense that knows what you're going through but there's a God in heaven that knows exactly what you're going through and he's able to secure he said preach I don't know where all this come from just reading that little statement the son of God amen I'm telling you he's my Lord this morning he's writing to the church he has a word for God's people. Oh, beloved friend, he's the one that secures. Then I put this down. He's the one that searches. You say, preacher, what do you mean? Look here. The Bible said, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire. His eyes are like unto a flame of fire. Let me tell you where revival fires, I believe, could break out like no other place. Listen to me carefully. It would be if we would mean it and get into the spirit that David was in. In Psalm chapter 139, David, listen to me carefully right here, listen to me. I don't believe any of us would say this about ourselves, but God said it about David. Said he was a man after God's own heart. Listen to me carefully. What happened with David? He said, search me, O oh God. Yeah. You see, God's the one that searches. He searches the, the, the heart. He searches the reins. The word of God said right here, his eyes are like unto a flame of fire. But you see what David did? By the way, oh, and I, I better not go. Yeah, I'm going there. That wasn't after David deleted the emails he didn't want anybody else to see. <laughs> Say amen. I'm telling you, David laid his whole life out and said, search me, oh God. He said, I'll tell you what I want you to look for, Lord. Look for that wicked way. Look for it, Lord. Y'all, you know, I tell you where we live. Oh, I ain't had nothing to drink this week, so I ain't wicked. I ain't smoked a cigarette this week, so I ain't wicked. I ain't looked at no dirty pictures or dirty movies this week, so I ain't wicked. Let me tell you something, everything I just named, it hurts us, it's wicked, but let me tell you something, pride is just as wicked, envy's just as wicked, jealousy's just as wicked. I tell you, God said, oh, David, come before God and said, God, turn the searchlight on. Look down in here, see if there's anything wicked in my heart. And in my life. How many believes David meant it? I believe he meant every word of it. Here's the verse exactly. Search me, oh God, know my heart. Try me and know my, wow, thoughts. Anybody besides this pastor have a, a problem with that thing that sits on your shoulders? Anybody besides me have a problem with your thought processes at times and your mind? If there's no other reason to encourage young people to sow to righteousness, that ought to be reason enough. Amen. David then said, and see if there be any wicked way in me. And then he said, lead me in the way everlasting I just happened to think about something here on my, on my phone. I don't know if you can see it or not. If it was dark, you could see it. Can you see it? It's a light. And it'll do in a pinch. I'm telling you, I've got better lights, but it'll do in a pinch. I tell you what, if I walked into your living room, ladies, you wouldn't care about that light being on. 
But if I went over in front of your refrigerator and started to get down on my knees and shine that light up under your refrigerator, you might say, whoa, pastor, what are you doing? (laughs) Been a while since underneath there has been visited. Say amen. God's not interested in shining his light on the outside. It's down on the inside where we're having trouble. It's down on the inside when his light shines down in there. We begin to cry, Brother Ralph, it's not my brother. It's not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Amen. I'll tell you this morning, David said, God, turn the searchlight on. Up there in Baltimore, Maryland, I don't know why this comes back to my memory, but it seemed like every time there would be a big event, they had this light, Brother Rose, that shined up into the sky and would rotate. You could see it for miles and miles and miles on a clear night. Can I tell you something right now? Our Lord's got a light a whole lot brighter than that. And I tell you, when God's people would begin to say, Lord, turn that light on. Lord, there can be stuff in here that I'm not even aware of. I believe with all my heart, revival fire can break out, amen. Oh, oh, Isaiah, he spent five chapters in Isaiah. Woe unto them, woe unto them, woe unto them, woe unto them that call good evil and evil good. Five chapters he spent You say, preacher, what happened in chapter six? He saw also the Lord, the light come on. I don't read any woe unto them in chapter six. He didn't have time to fool with them. He said, woe is me. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Oh, beloved, he's the one that searches. And then let me give you this. I think we'll wrap up for this morning. He's the one that's sovereign. You say, preacher, what do you mean? His feet are like unto fine brass. He said here, his eyes are like unto a flame of fire and his feet are like unto fine brass. How many knows what brass speaks of in the Bible? It speaks of judgment. You see, please remember this. I had a man say last week, he said something, he didn't mean nothing by it. But I told him, if you live very long for the Lord, you'll walk up and especially, I guess, if you're a pastor or maybe a deacon or a Sunday school teacher and people know it. Brother Brian, you may have experienced this in the schools and the hospitals. You'll walk up and there's two or three or four or five standing around and they're saying things they hadn't ought to be saying. They're listening to things. I'm talking about them old dirty jokes or you know what I mean. There's a lot of filth in the world. And if, if, you, if you'll watch, sometimes somebody will say, oh, better clam it up. Here comes the preacher. You know what I do? I just keep coming. I walk right in their midst. And this is what I tell them. Boys, you don't have to worry about me. The one you're gonna answer to was here a long time before I got here. He heard everything you said. And I'll say something like this, boys, he doesn't know what you said. He knows what you're thinking. Amen. I love that in the gospels, don't you, when Jesus tells them what they're thinking. (laughs) Let me tell you something right now. He's the judge. His feet are like unto a fine brass. And there's coming a day when God's people will give an account at the judgment seat of Christ. There's coming a day when sinner people will stand before him at the great white throne judgment. There's coming a day when the nations will be judged. But listen, on this day, here's the judgment we need to be thinking about. We need to be judging ourselves that we be not judged with the world. That's what David was doing when he said, search me, O God. He was judging himself. He was saying, Lord, see if there be any wicked. How many believes the heart's deceitful and desperately wicked? That's why 
Brother Steve, we can go through life. Man, I'm doing pretty good. I, especially if I, you know, look over, I say, well, according to old Brother Logan, I'm doing great. Well, old Brother Logan ain't the one I'm going to answer to. It's Brother Jesus. Amen. Are you listening to me? Yeah. He's the judge. And beloved, I'll tell you something right now. We can think we're doing real good and not be doing. Matter of fact, I doubt if anybody that thinks they're doing real good is doing real good. The people in the Bible that were doing real good, Brother Grizzle wouldn't even mention their own name. John say that other disciple. He could have just as easily said John. You say, what's he saying, preacher, when in doing such things? I tell you what he's saying. He's saying it ain't about John. It's about Jesus. Oh, to God that our church would be sending out a message. It ain't about us. It's about Jesus. Oh, that dads and papaws would be sending the message to their family. It's not about us. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. Let's talk about Jesus. The King of Kings is He, the Lord of all supreme throughout eternity. The great I am the way, the truth, the life, the door. Let's talk about Jesus more and more. Amen. Well, all of that welled up in my heart when I looked at a little phrase, the Son of God. He's something, isn't he? And you say, preacher, what are we going to do when we get to heaven? I believe one of the first things you'll do is fall down at his feet. I believe that'll be the first thing we do. John said he fell at his feet as dead. We might start kissing right there. You say, preacher, where'd you get that? Well, there was a woman in the Bible that had been forgiven for her ungodly ways. And the tears would run out of her eyes and she washed the feet of the Lord Jesus. Another woman took an alabaster box of ointment, very precious, Judas, the treasurer. He was crooked. Said you should have sold that and it should have been sold and given to the poor. It wasn't that he cared about the poor. Jesus said against the day of my burying, she understands more than any of you. I'm fixing to be crucified. And she, he said, it'll not be taken from her. It'll be mentioned throughout the ages. Yeah. I'll tell you something right now. I believe maybe when we get done there at his feet, maybe we'll get to rise at some point. I don't know. But I know this. It was special when I was able to put my arms around my daddy's neck and hug my daddy. And maybe the day will come I'll get to hug my heavenly father. Amen. Maybe he'll hug us. I believe he will. We'll get all that done. That might take 10,000 years, but don't matter. They don't measure time anymore. Time will be no more. Amen. Then, Brother Gail, you might come up to pastor. I could just see Brother Gail coming up to pastor and saying, Pastor, you tried your best. I know you did. You tried your best to tell us how wonderful the Son of God is. But, Pastor, I guess you already know you just couldn't get it done down there. And I'd say you're right, Brother Gail. Brother Rossi might walk up and say, Pastor, you didn't even tell us the half. The half was not told. And I'll say, you're right, Brother Rossi. You say, Preacher, what are you doing spending your life just giving him a best shot? Amen. I want you to know he's the son of God. He's coming again. And he's coming for those that have given been given space to repent and repented and trusted Jesus as their savior. That's who he's coming after. Amen. Let's bow for prayer this morning. Father in heaven, I truly am grateful and thankful 
for your blessings.